It is just a huge honor to be sitting here in Sydney, Australia with my very good friend, Mr. Carl Burroughs, uh, looking over the Sydney Harbor. My God, I, you know, I live in the desert. You know, there's just sand and uh, this harbor is so exciting. Ryan and I have been going on, we've been going on a two hour walk every morning, a two hour walk at night, just walking around the harbor. You just lose concept of time. It seems like every time we go on a walk, all of a sudden I'm like, God, I'm getting tired. How long have we been walking? If we look at the clock, it's been like two hours. <laughs> looking at all the boats. And in fact, I heard, that was the funniest thing today, I, I, I heard a train. And I turned to the guy, he said, uh, where's the train? They go, no, that's a boat, that's a yacht. And it had a same damn horn. Did you hear, remember hearing that? It sounded just like a damn train. Uh, Carl is a true serial entrepreneur. He started making money serving his patient shop at the age of eight. He bought his first house at the age of 17. He was fundamental in the success of the very first combined legal and real estate business in the UK, taking a 60% market share of all property listings in his home city of York. In 1993, he emigrated to Australia and started the telecommunications retail chain Communique, building this to 26 locations and an annual revenue of over $12 million within five years. And in 2000, he bought a Sydney-based marketing company, which formed the foundation of his current company, Integrated Dental Marketing. In 2001, Dr. Derek Mahoney asked Carl to speak at an orthodontic conference in Sydney, which was his first introduction to the profession of dentistry. Since this time, Carl has built the first and largest advertising agency in Australia dedicated to the dental profession, IDM. He started the first dedicated dental patient finance plan, Smile Card. He was the co-founder of the dental group Dental Partners, now known as Maven, and has created hundreds of new dental brands across the country for his clients. More recently, Carl started the Marketing Dentistry Institute, bringing speakers to Australia such as Dr. Bill Dorfman, Dr. Mark Costas, Dr. Michael Abernathy, and the incomparable Dr. Howard Ferrand. Carl, I actually wrote that part in. <laughs> Carl also owns two dental practices himself where he practices what he preaches, growing the first practice he bought by over 220% in the first 15 months of ownership. He is married to his beautiful wife, Angelica, and together they have their 10-year-old daughter, Grace. Any downtime is spent motorcycling, and he recently came back from a month motorcycling around Nepal. Did you go to Kathmandu? Yes, or? yes started in Kathmandu. You started Kathmandu. Did you go to the base of Everest? Uh, yes, we, were, we flew over Everest as well, and we got as far as uh, 4,000 meters up on the bikes, which is about as high as you can get on motorcycles. And the, yeah. the and Everest is 8,000 meters, yes, right? Yes, that's right. So, yeah. so basically, um, I had this crazy idea that I was going to climb the tallest summit of all seven continents. Yep. And I started in Africa, which of the seven is the middle. It's 19,000 square feet. Last time I came to Australia and lectured, you brought me down. Yep. I climbed um, um, the hot ties in uh, Australia, Mount Kosciuszko, yep. which is the shortest mountain mm -hmm. of the 17. But when I was lectured in Kathmandu, um, I went to the airport and I chartered a uh, aircraft um, to fly me over Everest because I wanted to take a look at it. And the guy said, well, I, I can't fly over Everest. I said, what? And he goes, well, in, in the Rockies in America, the, the tallest mountains are 14,000 mm. feet. He goes, base camp of Everest is higher than that, and it's 28,000 feet. Yeah. So your high Rockies, you'd have to double. So I'm like, okay, I want to see this. So he, we flew, and um, we got to that thing. I was looking out the window. I mean, that looked like, that looked, that was the creepiest but how do you work out which one it is? It's like amazing, isn't it? There, oh. From the air, there, there's so many. And it's like, I had to have the, the pilot say, that's Everest. And like, it doesn't even look like the tallest one from the air. For, uh, from where you were at 14,000? No, no, from, from where we, we flew. We had a little oh, scenic yeah. flight over. It's just, it's I, I, I never understood the depth of the Himalayas. You know, I always thought it, the Everest was like you know, one mountain. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they have hundreds of peaks that yeah, are over, like, over 20,000 yeah. feet or something. Yeah. But I looked at that window and I saw the thing. I thought it just looked eerie. Yeah. And and it, I, you got an appreciation of what twenty eight thousand feet looked like. And the last, I would say the last four thousand feet looked like just a suicide mission. Mm. I was like, <laughs> like not gonna do that. But I, I want to start off this question with you. Um, so you remember Ruth and George Port, mm -hmm, George of Port, uh, Port yeah. Laboratories. George passed on. They started bringing me down here in the nineties, and um, they. Like three times they brought me on this tour ride. 
like you're in Auckland, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Gold Coast, Perth. And I did that like every five years, three, I think three times. And in the 90s, the problem was everybody was booked two months in advance. What do you do with emergencies? You know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was the, go I mean, it was crazy. Mm. Any dentist could open up and be booked out a, a month or two months in advance. I remember meeting a dentist in Brisbane. He had no openings for three months. Now, flash forward to 2017. My God, um, in the last uh, three years, you let in, you know, 10% more dentists just from Asia. You uh, doubled the number of dental schools, um, corporate dentistry chains, um, medical insurance coming to like Bupa building practices. It's really changed in Australia from a completely non-competitive environment to a very competitive environment. Absolutely, yes. Would yeah. you agree with all that? Yeah, totally. And even when I started, I mean, I started in 2001 and, uh, you know, I'd go and see uh, practices here in Sydney and the, the, the biggest problem they had was they couldn't find a, an associate dentist. So they say, all that marketing mumbo jumbo, we're not interested in that. You know, we're already booked out. Um, but yes, you could say fast forward. And, you know, it's an ever, it's an ever shifting thing. Um, you know, when you came out uh, for me two years ago, you know, uh, David Penn opened talking about the doom and gloom. We've had pretty much been the same conversation for maybe four or five years. And dentistry is not falling off a cliff. Um, and this is, this is testament to the fact that there's, you know, a very strong patient-doctor relationship. So it's not as if a piece of technology comes in like Uber and everything changes overnight. But it, it is, it's a slow death. You know, it, and people's incomes are starting to diminish. And when you're on a pretty good income and, you know, 50 grand drops off, you don't tend to notice it, then 100 grand drops off. But it, it's a slow decline. So the, the, uh, it's getting far more competitive. And is it gonna? Is that gonna keep going? I mean, do you think it's ten years from now will it be even more competitive? Oh, totally. It, every year is going to get more competitive, and which means people have to get smarter about the uh, the way they run the businesses and actually look at the business side of the practice. Um, dentistry is one of the greatest professions in the world because you get paid uh, for helping people, and the more people you help, the more money you make. So there's no conflict in that. Um, but you know, getting the business side of the the practice right um, is no longer an option. Where you know, at one point, you know, if you didn't get it right, well, you'd still be busy. So you have many many websites. You have idm.com.au. You have marketingdentistry.com.au. Divinedental.com. Um, which which um, let, let's start with. Um, so we start with IDM. Yeah, so or, I, or I, not. I, yeah, IDM is my marketing business. It's been it's integrated dental, dental marketing. marketing. Yeah. And that's been my uh, introduction into the dental profession, and that's what I've been doing for the last 16 years. But it does lead to an awful lot of other ventures. So the, uh, the friends I make through IDM and obviously the marketing power that we've got uh, tends to lead on to other things. Can I tell you why I would not start a dental marketing company if I was you? You know, you know why I wouldn't do that? Why? Because I would be afraid that I would do a great job for dentists and they wouldn't know it because the data I see from America, 10 people have to land on your website before your horrible website can convert one to call the office. Mm -hmm. Three people have to call your office before your re untrained receptionist can convert one to come in. Three people have to come into the cavity before your horrible presentation can convert one to have a filling. So the average dentist's office in the United States collects 750 in revenue and they take home 180. Mm -hmm. So to take home 180, to do that filling, you'd have three to come in. To have three to come in, nine had to call. To have nine call, 90 had to land on your website. So I would be afraid I'd do a bunch of marketing and these horrible offices say, well, it didn't, it didn't help. Because you could serve them, you literally have to serve them 90 leads. You could get an A in your job. You could serve them 90 leads and it would only translate to one filling because you serve them a lead to their website, but their website is so horrible it can't convert. They call the office, the untrained receptionist can't convert. You tell them you have a cavity in America for just cavities, they only have a 38% close rate to drill, fill, and bill. Crazy. So you, you could get an A and the customer writing the check, the dentist says, well, that, Carl's, it didn't work. Mm. And don't get, me, don't get me wrong, that, that over 16 years that has happened on many, many occasions. 
you know, when, when uh, I, I learned very early on, one of the very first uh, big marketing campaigns we did for a client, we did a huge flyer drop. Flyer drop was going out on Monday and Tuesday. He closed his office on a Wednesday and didn't even tell me. So the phone wasn't manned. So the phone's are like lit up. It's going to an answer phone. So, you know, I, I learned very early on yeah. that uh, you have to take a holistic view. And most of my clients today, um, we, we will only work with clients who are prepared to actually embrace every part of you know the business so when you do integrated general marketing you do more than um drop flyers and deliver leads to the website you try to follow yes yeah, so the website you know, to the phone call to the come in where, where we possibly can um you know we take on all sorts of clients of different sizes but where we where we work best is where we get an engaged client and they're prepared to listen to you know all aspects so you know business is a jigsaw puzzle and marketing is only one of the pieces it's an important part because it starts the conversation but if the conversation doesn't then continue in the right way, it's, it's spinning wheels and it's wasting money. So we tend to be a little bit picky who we work with in terms of, I want people who are going to make sure that they're, they're looking at their internal systems, make sure they're looking at the patient experience, make sure that you know, all the, the messages are right. And uh, you know, we're lucky that we can be a little bit picky who we work with. Um, because as, as you said, there's just literally no point in spending money on advertising in particular if you haven't got the other pieces in place. Well, that's great that you're picky because that's why I've never joined a country club because I wouldn't join a country club that would take me as a member. <laughs> if you take me as a member, I'm not joining. And uh, so so, so, what are you... So if dentists went to idm.com.au, what would they find? What would you do for them? Is that the site they should go to? Or? Yeah, that's a good site to, to start. To start? Um, but, you know, our service really starts uh, consulting with a, a new client and seeing what their, their needs are. And it's not a matter of rushing in and doing a whole heap of marketing. It's a matter of understanding what their, their needs are and trying to get a program to fulfill those needs. You know, very often, um, you know, there's big gaps in the service that they provide. Very often, uh, the, there's no point in marketing it because maybe the, uh, the actual location or the fit out isn't of a standard that I think is is worth promoting. So we will advise in that situation. Now we're not shop fitters and we're not you know other things, but we would lead them and say, well, really you should fix that, fix that first. And working with a lovely practice in Melbourne at the moment, and I say, well, everything's right, your motivation's there, but your place looks like a, you know like a hole. Uh, get rid of the carpets, paint the walls, and uh, by that time we'll have a new website ready for you. And they they agree to do that. Yeah, I remember one time we were having a staff meeting. And I wanted to buy um, a CBCT, and it was a it was a CareStream CBCT. It was I think it was one hundred twenty thousand dollars or something. And my uh, my girls up front said, uh, "Oh my God, you know the dentist owns the place, so we're going to upgrade our two D Pano to a hundred and some thousand dollars three D CBCT." And and th this place hasn't been remodeled in eight years, mm -hmm. and the colors are horrible, and this and that, and this and that, and me, I don't know, if, I can't say it's me being a guy that's sexist, because maybe I'm just, uh, I'm sure there's guys that are more into it than, than I am, and uh, I was looking around and saying, well, th this place looks nice, and they were like, are you kidding me, this place, it's <laughs> so outdated, the colors are so bad. So to get them on board, I had to spend, to buy my $120,000 CBCT, I had to spend $70,000 repainting. They wanted new linoleum in the operatories. They wanted um, new paint, new carpet, new everything. And in all honesty, they redid the whole thing. And I thought, I, 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 I didn't, to me, it was just like mm. just a total waste of money. But I was very surprised at how many well, patients noticed it, exactly. how many people and said it. Good on you for doing it, it, and good on you for listening to your staff because your staff are often your best, your best source of uh, real feedback. Yeah, but a lot of people won't listen to them. Yeah, mm. I mean you got. I mean the three H's. I mean you got to be humble, you got to be hungry, you got to hustle. And dentists aren't humble. They don't mm. listen to their staff. They don't listen to their patients. But um, I, I would tell you. Um, I see a big bias in marketing. I, I, I like to make decisions on data. I just want the data. Mm -hmm. I just want the facts. And I don't have a dog in all these decisions. I mean, I just I just want to see the data. And I, I think I learned that the most um, with Sergey Brin and Larry Page of Google's. They wrote a, a book called Google Management. Mm -hmm. And it was basically saying, look, our, our, our 
our Google, I mean, we, we know every point and click. We have all your cookies. It's, it should be all data driven. So mm -hmm. if you go into Google and say, well, I think we should do this. They say, well, that's great. Show us your data. And you don't have any data. You say, oh, that, that's just my opinion. Yeah. You're off the management team. They're yeah. like, go program. You're not a manager. They only want data. And when I look at marketing, um, I see a bias between um, um, baby boomers like me and millennials. Um, millennials hate direct mail. But I think it's because they're environmentalists. They don't like going to their mailbox getting direct mail. They personally don't like direct mail. They're always on Facebook all day long. They want all digital. But when I look at the data, direct mail is still alive and doing well. Um, but all the millennials uh, are convinced that it doesn't work. And you should just be doing Google AdWords and Facebook AdWords and SEO. So, so we, we live in constantly changing times. And you've got to, you've got to look at your media and say what's changed in the last 10 years. So, you know, Yellow Pages was on the nose for a very long time. I was taking my clients out of Yellow Pages 10 years ago. And of course, that's now just, you know, just the norm. But you've got to look at, the, look at how media changes. Here, television has become massively fragmented in many ways. One, we've had an explosion of TV stations, which actually the, means that it's affordable to advertise on TV, but then you haven't got the audience. And we're not watching TV as much, or if we are, we're, we're tuning out. So you look at all these different mediums and you say, well, how have they changed? Radio, people are spending more time in the car because of the traffic problems. Radio is probably on, on the up and up. But the letterbox essentially hasn't changed. We got we got less the, what? the letterbox, the, what? The, the the mailer. You call that a letterbox? Yeah, uh. we have to empty our letterboxes. So it's a letterbox. Yeah. So okay. um, I never heard that term. <laughs> <laughs> so the you know we still we still collect our mail every day, and there's less mail, um, but there's also less junk mail as well as as millenniums are saying we don't want to do it. So the cut through I'm finding is pretty much the same as it was ten years ago we get a quarter of 1% response rate. So if we send out 10,000 flyers, we broadly get 25 new patients. That's okay. It's expensive, but the difference is the 25 new patients we get from those flyers would not have found us on Google. They would not have found us in another way. It's a different patient. And quite regularly, you know, maybe it's an older patient that might need some more work doing. So you, when you track something, you've got to track just not the raw numbers, but how that turns into the till. You get one person who spends enough money out of a flyer, it makes it worthwhile. You, know, you get a, you know, a lot of people just coming in for an exam off uh, Google Ads. It's, you know, it's, you've got to look at all of that. So you know, I, um, <laughs> so I'm in Phoenix, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of retirees in Phoenix. I cannot tell you how many grandpas... When you say older, how, how, what do you mean by older? How, where's well, old? Well, where I live in, in uh, Queensland, it's, an, it's the, uh, an early retiree capital. So you, anybody who's made a bit of cash, uh, 55 and over, tends to be there. Good, now, I'm 54, so I'm, I'm not <laughs> You're old. not there I'm, yet. I'm not old yet. And, of course, you know, the, uh, the 50s, we've been used to uh, the internet for 20 years, so we're, we're pretty up on it. So, you know, the, the people we get in from mailers, uh, it's, it's a broad spectrum. Um, but tend to, tend to be the older person, 60 or no. Do you remember when the internet first came, when it first came out, the, the PC? One of the biggest concerns when Bill Gates was shopping out his, um, you know, there were mainframes. Mm -hmm. And then they were going to come out, so the mainframe, they're going to come out with microcomputers, which was Microsoft. And it, now they called it the personal computer. But a lot of the people said, well, this isn't going to fly because uh, people don't type. Mm hmm and most people didn't have typing class. I still have old grandpas on my desk said, well, did you get on the internet? And, they, and, the, and this guy goes, uh, well, you know, I, I never typed. Now my wife, she took typing in high school, so mm -hmm. she, she's, she's on, the, on the internet and the computer, but I, I'm, I'm not a typer. And I thought to myself, you miss, you miss the whole internet because you're not a typer. Yeah. And so I imagine um, if you were looking for older patients for implants, and removable and fixed, that direct mail would have to be far more effective, wouldn't it, if you were building up an implant practice? Well, it's broader than that in the, in the sense that you really need to be across all mediums, and some traditional media fits most practices as well as, as online. Online's great because you're matching 
buyer and seller. So when you're looking on something for Google, you're interested. But what about brand building? What about building uh, your your image for somebody who doesn't need your services today but might need them tomorrow? So then are the media still relevant for that? So you've got to look at it in a holistic approach. And, you know, with the flyers, you, know, you get people of all sorts of age and groups, but you do it because maybe you wouldn't have got that person through another medium. So the, a, a big uh, taboo question is... Um um, on your flyers, on your advertisements, um, whether or not to mention price or an economic incentive or a coupon. Uh, some people, what, what are your thoughts on... Well, it's, it's not a debatable point. If you send a flyer out without um, a price, you may as well just you know, throw your money down, down the drain. You've got to give people the, the knowledge of what they're coming in for. Now, we have certain rules here in terms of how we incentivize dentistry. Um, but if you have a fixed price, which is what I do with my practices, uh, you can certainly advertise that fixed price. Um, you know, the you think about the the fears that we people have in dentistry. Affordability is one of those. So take that off the table. Tell them how much it's going to cost to come in. But you need to do all of this, in my opinion, in a very very professional manner. So a voucher that is fluorescent green that has you know ninety nine dollars scale and clean. Um, it could work for some people, it wouldn't be my choice because it's not promoting a quality message. You know, it might be cheap, but you know, are you going to hurt the patient? It's a matter of getting lots of messages across. So when we do a flyer, we use uh, what we call a long copy uh, environment. So we're all the time talking about uh, something of quality, maybe it might be implants, might be orthodontics, There's a, you know, there will be a price of an exam examination scale and clean as well. Um, so you, you're touching, ticking the box, with, there might be a picture of one of the doctors giving a cheque to chari a charity um, on the flyer as well. So it's more like a newsletter format, but with the, with the, uh, the financial uh, offering built in as well. So a lot of these um, kids are coming out of school, and um, every graduating class since the beginning, since Adam and Eve, has claimed that when they got out of dental school, you know, the dental school didn't teach them how to do anything. They didn't learn how to place an implant, do Invisalign, yada, yada, yada. And I think it's a bad rap on the dental school because I can imagine taking 100 kids off the street in college and four years later turning them loose, licensed to do root canals and crowns. <laughs> I, so you, there's just not enough time in the day um, to teach them everything. But... When they come out of school, they're very. They're, they're saying, Carl, I have a lot of student loans, and I just bought a practice. I have a lot of debt. What are consumers wanting to buy the most? Should I learn Invisalign? Um, should I go out and learn um, placing implants? Should I learn cosmetics, sleep apnea? If your 10-year-old daughter was just walking out of dental school, let's fast forward her to 25, and she said, Dad, what services are most in demand in from your marketing point of view mm. what would you tell her to learn first second or third what what where would you tell her to prioritize um, well if she was uh, a young graduate then I'd want her to to get some experience before she started to take on any of the subspecializations and I think people can often rush that period um, I've got a young graduate working for me in one of my practices and she's wonderful so she came to us because she knew she'd be mentored so she liked the other doctors in the practice she didn't want on too much responsibility too quickly so she didn't want to take on her own practice at you know early 20s and I think that's quite smart I think too many people skip that apprentice uh, period but in terms of you know where they should go with their learning well clearly you know they're a doctor so they should be uh, looking at areas that they look to enjoy and maybe they have a, an interest but I'd be starting with the demographic if they're in a certain area you want to understand the demographic of that area and you know what the, what are the services you know what's the point in in doing you know um, you know orthodontics if you're in a mainly retiree market What's the point of doing Im implants if you're in a brand new uh, suburb that's full of young families? So I'd be looking at the demographics first, so my, my decision was based on what the, what the market demands. Saying that, um, you know, any practice that's ex ignoring orthodontics now uh, is, is foolish because it's going to be the biggest growing area of dentistry. Um, it's, you know, it's now a rite of passage for, for lots of kids and adults. And uh, for me, I think you know that would be an area that I want in in my practices for sure. You know, I grew up in Kansas, um, and it was a, a quarter Catholics, and uh, all the families were. I mean, having five kids, four kids was a small family. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom and dad had seven. Uh, my friend Brian Hesse, they had twenty one kids in their family. 
So only the most severe child got braces. Mm. But with the advent of uh, the smaller family coming delayed, and they're only having, you know, two kids, um, you're right, everybody gets braces. It is a rite of passage. Mm. I mean, I mean, I, I see kids getting orthodontics for the mildest cases, you know, in the world. Just slight little crowding, and uh, every, everybody gets it. Mm. So, so you, have, um, you have more than one website. So we talked about idm.com.au. Let's go to marketingdentistry.com.au. What's different about that site? What would my homies find at marketingdentistry.com? <laughs> well, they'll, they'll see lots of pictures and videos of you on there. So um, Of me? Yeah. So marketing, okay. marketing dentistry, uh, I started five years ago. Um, and it's, a, it's just a very simple three days over three cities. And uh, I'm trying to bring out the, uh, the best dental minds in the world. And um, yeah, so far we've uh, we've had a good response, and um, yeah, we're going to continue to do it. Um, it's really trying to get the Australian dentists to give them more exposure to what's going on overseas. Um, I've looked to America for all the speakers. So all my speakers to date have, have been from America because I look at what you guys have gone through, and um, you went through it a lot earlier than us. So I'm hoping that. Um, so when's your when's your next major meeting? Next next major major meeting is next August. Next August. Yeah. And who your speaker is going to be next August? Don't know yet. You're still still, still working picking on it. Up. And um, what was um, uh, Mike Abernathy's message? Uh, I, I really liked it, and thanks for the introduction to Mike. I was really pleased with uh, with Mike's approach. I felt that he had uh, some very very solid messages that, um, and we got really good feedback. Um, but again, you talked about you know, dentistry in a holistic way, so it wasn't as just a singular message, uh, getting all the pieces right. So not just the marketing, not just the, uh, the patient experience, but you have to get all the pieces right. So um, what other websites do you have? Or, or, um, I'm looking at um, Divine Dental. That's your dental office. That's my dental office, and the reason I gave you that one is it's got a nice video of my daughter on, which I'm very proud of. Oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, we got her to do a bit of a pop video. As um, so, when when I took on this practice, it's, we're in we're in a, a very early retiree type. Uh, Is that the second one's your daughter? Let's have a look. So when I uh, when I took over the practice, there you go. Oh wow! How adorable. Oh, how adorable. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> she get that showboat from her daddy? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> her mother's a ballerina. That helps. Is your mother a ballerina? Yeah. Wow, that is a uh, that is a brutal sport, isn't it? Is that yeah. it, or her feet uh um, that, that's they're a mess. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some of these uh, pictures of ballerinas' yeah. feet standing on your toes. Yeah, yeah. Can she so, still do it? Uh, she teaches now. Yeah, yeah so she teaches. But can she stand on her toes still? She hasn't done it for a while. Yeah, that's yeah. brutal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so so what are so what are you what are you most passionate about today? What are, what are you what are you doing today now? Um, so the IDM, my marketing company, stays the rock bed of what we do, and but it brings really, really interesting projects. Um, so at the moment, I'm marketing a new corporate group called Smiles Inc. So we've been employed to um, to market that group. Uh, uh, you're marketing Smiles Inc. Inc. Yeah, which is a new corporate group. Um, it's based on a joint venture partnership, so whereby the dentist retains um, ownership of uh, the practice at a local level. And Big Brother does all the things that Big Brother needs to do at a corporate level. And so who's this? Uh, so it's Smiles Inc. Yeah, dot com dot au. Dot au. And this is a new corporate chain. Yes. Yeah. And who, who's the CEO of that? So my, my old business partner, Mike Timoney. Mike. Oh, I. Yeah. That's right. So Mike T -I -M. and I start. T I Money. He likes T I T I Money. <laughs> T I Money. <laughs> Timoney. Mike yeah. Timoney. Yeah. So is he a dentist? No. So, so he started a new corporate yeah, dental Yeah, so his, his journey was, I met him back, uh, I think, in 2004. He just landed in Australia. Uh, his then wife was a dentist, and they formed a dental practice on the Gold Coast called Totally Teeth. And I did all the marketing. Turk, you're... Totally Teeth. Totally Teeth. Yeah. 
Um, so I did all the marketing for that, including the branding and coming up with the name. Uh, that was a big success. Off the back of that, uh, Mike and I decided that we'd, we'd form some corporate group that became Dental Partners. Uh, Mike was the CEO of that, and that grew very, very quickly under Mike's, uh, Mike's command. Uh, we sold that out to a New Zealand group. Uh, it's now called Maven. And then Mike's been sat on his hands for a few years, plotting his next, next venture. So he's employed us to do the marketing for that. And that's Smiles Inc. Yeah, and uh, I'm very excited about that. It's it's a different model. So, you know, one of the problems with the corporates is they once you purchase the practice, the the dentist is then in effect an employee. Um, where in this model, the, the dentist is retaining ownership at a local level, very much in the same way that uh, spec servers often work on a 50-50 basis with the optometrist and the head office, or the flight centre, which is often a 60-40 split between the manager and the, the head office function. What's the flight centre? It's, it's our biggest chain of uh, travel agents. Oh, okay, yeah. flight centre. But it means wins. that the person opening the door still has a vested interest. What, what percent? Uh, 40%. 40%. Mm. Yep. And how many offices does Smiles Inc. have now? Uh, none at the moment. That's that's the project. So that that's a new project? Yeah. Um, do you think it's a game changer that now medical insurance companies like Bupa are buying dental office? Some, some people think that um, when medical... Well, what, what, do you, what do you think of big medical insurance providers buying dental offices? Um, it would be interesting to see if any others go down the same path as, as Bupa. Um, you know, Boop has certainly changed the landscape. They bought Dental Corp here, as you know, and then they've rebadged Dental Corp. Um, so they've got they've got a good footprint. Um, if they're the only one who comes into the marketplace, I don't see them that that much of a challenge. Uh, they have an eight percent um, penetration in terms of eight, eight percent. Eight percent of the population are members of Boop. Uh, so you know that gives us another ninety two percent to market to. Um, but they're aggressive, um, they've got a great brand. When I was uh, a nipper in the UK, if you got a job and you got Booper insurance as part of uh, your job, you felt that you were, uh, you know, you were a rock star. So they, they've, they've got that, that prestige, probably less so in Australia than in the UK. Um, so Booper's in the UK too? Yes, yeah, very, very strong there. And New Zealand? I think, yes, I believe so. But, have they, but they have about 8% of the losses in the UK. Um, no, I don't believe so. It's, I think Australia's uh, and the rest of the Dental Corp platform they bought is a, is a new venture for them. And how long ago did they buy Dental Corp? A couple of years ago now. And who's who's the head of Bupa over their dental division? Don't know. Don't know. No. But do you think do you think they they like that um, investment? Do you think it's going well for them? I think so. It's. I mean, they've they've done the same with optometry over here as well. So they've now got Bupa Optometry. Um, yeah. And what do they call their dental? Just Boopa Dentistry? Yeah. yeah. Boopa Dental. Boopa Dental? Mm. Huh. Um, that, that, is, that is, but you're, uh, you, th you think they'll get bigger or do you think they might buy some more corporate chains or? Oh, I'm sure they'll, they'll continue to expand. Um, but being the core patient is the Boopa member. Um, and they really don't have a lot of pulling power to pull people in outside of that. They're just another practice. Then, you know, it'd be interesting to see. I, d I don't see them, uh, you know, becoming a monopoly in, in Australia by any means. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. So you're excited about Smiles Inc. with Mike Timoney? Yeah, <laughs> very excited about that. It's is great. Timoney, is that Irish, Timoney? Yes, originally. Yeah, yeah that sounds uh, Irish. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, but no, it's, I mean, these, these things are exciting to me because it's a new venture. I do the marketing. I don't take any sort of judgment on, on whether it's a good thing or not. It's, I have to do the marketing. So the marketing for that's been very exciting because we've been marketing back to the profession um, as opposed to marketing to the public. Dentists get mad at me, but um, I think corporate dentistry has been good for dentistry. Mm -hmm. they get, I, I had one of my very good friends text me today, and uh, he says... He said to me on a text, he said, whatever you say that, I want you to know that I think you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the reason I think it's good is because um, when I was little, um, I was born in 62. On, on a Saturday or Sunday, if you walk down my street for eight blocks, every third or fourth house, the dad and his brothers and sons were spending a whole day in the garage trying to fix their stupid Ford, Chevy, and Chrysler. The mm -hmm. cars were horrible. And it wasn't until Japan, and I remember when Germany started selling these little Volkswagen BWs, 
and Japan was sending these little Datsun B210s, and everybody laughed at these toy little stupid Japanese and German cars, and it, they never stopped. And it, and when I was little, General Motors sold half the cars in America, mm -hmm. and now they don't even sell 30%. And it was Japan and Germany, that competition that forced Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors to build a decent car. In fact, um, I think advertising is funny because um, they're always advertising their weak spot. Like when they say two scoops of raisins in every box, that's because there's no raisins in Raisin Bran. <laughs> Only American cars talk about their, their warranty. Yeah. Because they're shitty cars. They, they, don't, they don't talk about warranties in Japanese cars and German cars because you know the car's going to work. Mm. And in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, um, you're better off to get shot or break your leg on a Sunday because the ambulance will be there. They'll pick you up. They'll take you to the hospital. They're open. Mm -hmm. There's not one dentist in Phoenix, Arizona open on a Sunday. Yeah. And what corporate dentistry is doing, it's providing competition and it's making this, this cottage industry rise up to their A game on facility, on equipment, on consumerism, on hours, on affordability, on insurance, you know what I mean? Mm, totally. And, and that's good for um, the, um, the, the patient. And also, if you build a dental office too big, like in America, the only house that you can sell like that is a three bedroom, two bath. Mm -hmm. But by the time you get a house that's a million dollar house with six bedrooms and a nine car garage, you can't sell it, it's mm -hmm. an illiquid asset. And when you build a practice that's between two, three, and four million, no kid comes out of dental school and buys a practice that, that big. But the corporate chains like Heartland, they can come in and pay you a check for four million dollars for this beast today. So they give liquidity to the too big of offices. Mm -hmm. When the kids come out of school, the dentists are, um, they don't hire associates and extend their hours. Who hires about half the graduating class every year is corporate dentistry. Mm -hmm. So they provide jobs for the kids, they provide liquidity to the retirees, and they make everybody else bring their A-game to compete. And so think, that's good for an industry. Absolutely. And I think, look, I think a, a bigger uh, thing is that it's change, and there's no point of having negative uh, rhetoric about change. It's going to happen. So as change happens, you have to adapt with it. And uh, the people who go, well, I wish it hadn't happened, or, you know, I don't agree with it, big deal. It's only an opinion. It's not going to ch stop the change. And the other thing is the average dentist in America made one, general dentist made mm -hmm. 180. Okay, how many people in Australia feel sorry for you if you make 180000 a year? <laughs> is that a good job? Yeah, well, look, I'd feel pretty sorry for you if you made $180,000 as a dentist here. Right, but, our but, guys but, are making quite say, a lot more money than this. I know, but but still, yeah. uh, is $180,000 a damn good income, or is it not? Absolutely. And, I mean, and, if your daughter came to you, and, and she came to you at 25, and she goes, Dad, the bad news is I'm only making $180,000 a year. Mm. Would you start crying, or would you say... God dang, girl, that's good money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 180 is good money. Yeah. And there's a lot of dentists that if they shredded their dental license, they couldn't go out and make 80 outside mm -hmm. of dentistry. How many dentists do you know that make 180 in the United States if they lost their license, couldn't get a job for 80,000 here? Mm. What percent? Yeah. yeah, no idea. But I mean, unless they've diversified their skills, you know, probably few. Yeah. There's only so exactly. many people can lecture, and so many people can do other things around dentistry. Yeah. Mm. So, so what is so if someone in Australia, or, or most all your clients in Australia? Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, if someone in Australia is watching this. Um, what is your favorite client? What what would what what do you like to do? Who, who should be calling you? Very what simple. You? Anybody who's motivated for change doesn't matter if they're starting off, they've got a brand new practice or they're in the you know, last five years of, of the practice, if they're motivated to see change and they're actually signing up for change, then we can help them. Um, they're my favorite clients. We, we help uh, small, large, medium sized, but the one common denominator with the clients I like working with is they really want to see a difference uh, at the end of a campaign. And what do you, um, you talk about spending more time on online marketing and less time on social media. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so I've, because of the, the buzz around social media, I'm seeing a lot of practices uh, spending a lot of time on the Facebook page. Not Facebook advertising, but on the Facebook page. And this can suck up a lot of time talking to probably a relatively small audience, an audience that already knows you. Now, it's, it's important to keep in touch with your patients in many, many ways, and Facebook is one of those. But I see this as being an absolute just sucks up all the time, and then they're not spending enough time on 
online marketing. So Google AdWords, SEO, all the things that hang off uh, Google AdWords. Um, you know, all the tools, and as you say, Google are, are brilliant, they pu publish everything. If everybody just went and read what Google published, they'd, they'd all be experts. Um, but I don't see many people really using all the tools correctly. And there's a lot of wastage, people paying far too much for, for AdWords when they don't need to, not hanging off all the other things that can be triggered by AdWords, uh, not spending enough money on Facebook advertising, um, you know, not paying attention to that. But this Facebook, which is a bit addictive, and there'll be somebody in the office who knows how to do it, um, it seems to suck up all the time. So that's what I mean. So what is... Um so, so go to Google. Um, um, it's, it's whenever someone sends me an email, um, like like your email, can I get out your your email? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. So you're Carl at IDM for Integrated Dental Marketing dot com dot au. Yeah. So when someone sends me an email, Carl at IDM dot com. So I'll hit reply and I'll cut. I'll drop that in the the deal. Knock off Carl and put www to see who the hell yeah. I'm talking to. So I do that um, on all the emails because I'm just curious who you are. Because most people send me a question and just say Carl. Mm. I'm like Carl who? So I go to their website. Those websites almost ninety percent look like they were at a dental convention five, ten, fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. and they bought some can thing. Half of them don't even have a picture of the dentist. Um, if it does have a picture of the dentist, it looks like a mug shot when they got arrested for drinking mm -hmm. and driving. Um, and then they wonder why 10 people have to land before one will convert. So if you do all this Google AdWords, you, you do everything right, what percent of the time is it going to drive them to a website that's not going to convert? Well, we tend to not do online marketing unless we've designed the website. So we would take control over the website as well. And you're absolutely right. There's certain elements of a website that are just essential. Uh, people want things to act quickly now, and this isn't just to attract a new patient. If you're an existing patient or an existing customer of any business, um, you know if you can't do certain things easily, if you can't book your restaurant uh, table online now, people are not calling restaurants anymore. It's all done on a on an app. If you can't book your your, your taxi, if you can't book your pizza to be delivered and track it being you know coming around the street corner. If, if these are things that the public like, and that dentistry is no different. It used to drive me nuts. My my de my own dentist in uh, Sydney, very good friend of mine, Kurt Dean, and uh, I'd go for a beer with him on a Sunday night, and I said, "Oh mate, I've really got to come and see you. Can you book me in?" And he goes, "No, oh, no, you've got to ring Jenny on Monday morning." And of course, I wouldn't ring Jenny on Monday morning because I was busy. So you know, we need to ad adapt for people's uh, online requirements, which is very simple. If your website doesn't interact with the maps, if you're not on the map, Google Map, if you haven't got online booking, if you haven't got live chat, if you haven't got video, if it isn't personable, you talked about uh, photography. You know, a cheap option. We, we have a full-time photographer, Simon, and all he does is he must have shot more dental practices than anybody on the planet. He just goes and shoots the dental practices. It's still photography. He's cheap, but then suddenly you've got the personality of the practitioner. You've got the personality of the practice. You know, and most of the stock images, I don't like to you know, uh, dish the, uh, the Americans, but most of our stock images look like American families. We don't look like American families. I don't think Americans look like stock images <laughs> American families either. So you've got all these plastic people on your website that don't look like your patients, don't look like you. It's such a turn-off. Put you know, good photography on the site and, and start telling people who you are. If they don't like the look of you, great, you've just saved a, saved a whole heap of hassle. And um, yeah, so there's there's a lot to it, but it is actually incredibly pragmatic. On my website for my photo, I have a picture of Marky Mark Wahlberg <laughs> in his uh, Fruity Loom underwear, and it's worked it's worked very well yeah. for me. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think the websites are. Um, I, I, what, so so you build them from scratch? Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody just uses a, a platform a these word days. WordPress, is, WordPress. You know, that doesn't matter. That's it's, it's like a lot of technology. The technology now is simple. 
it's the content, it's the it's the intellectual side. That's and what about works. so? How's the scheduling online working for you? What what are you using for that? So in my own practice, I use Health Engine. Um, there's a number of platforms out there for uh, scheduling online. Yeah, and I love it. It's uh, Health Engine. Health Engine. Is that only Australian market? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, it's uh, they've they've uh, offered a plugin. Um, the dental software. So it's www.healthengine. Yes, correct. Um, www. Dot. So does it interface with um, health e and g i n. Dot com. Dot au. Mm -hmm. And how many of these um, practice management softwares does it integrate with? It, it's fairly simple, and it's it's very easy to to take the uh, the information, put it into your software. Um, some of the software packages out now that have integrated ones, so Dental for Windows have a good integrated package Which as well. Which one does? Dental for Windows, which is probably our most popular dental software Dental here. for Windows. Um, I see on the health engine it says book a doctor, dentist, physio yeah. and more. Is a physio a physical therapist? Yeah. So we don't use their website, we just use a their, plug their plugin. So nobody knows that it's them, nobody goes to their website, we, but they use it on our website and we get the information. I've got to say, in my practice, we get four or five online bookings a day. It's a fairly small practice. And, um, and it's, it's not just new patients, but it's existing patients who like the convenience. And um, so a dentist told us yesterday that um, he thinks people who book online uh, don't show up, that they don't show up for their appointments. Well, that's absolutely true in my, my practice. So people who book online are the people who want to have the convenience of being able to talk to you after hours most of the time. Most of our bookings at my practice would come in Sunday night, somebody either has got a dental emergency or they've just remembered that they need to go to the practice. And, and I, I've seen this rodeo before. I remember, um, I remember when the um, ATM machine came out mm -hmm. and everybody said, well, nobody's going to use an ATM when they could walk in there and see... Mary Lou at the at the counter. Why the hell would who would want to talk to a machine? Yeah. They could talk to Mary Lou, but it turned out actually more people prefer the machine because the ATM machine because it's twenty four hours a day, it's seven days a week. And you said it before. It, these things are not anecdotal; they're statistical. And my statistics show that people love being able to book online, and they do turn up. So, have you met the Dr. Marcus Tan? He's the health engine founder, CEO, and medical director. No, no, I haven't. Angel met. investor and father, yeah. not necessarily in that order. <laughs> That's pretty. He's from Perth. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, so you um, you recommend the website books appointments online. Absolutely. You um, recommend um, that the uh, they their interface with Google Maps. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely have to have the website. What is, what is it called when the website is mobile friendly? Yep, that's it. Mobile friendly. Mobile friendly. Yep. Um, or do they call it fully responsive design? Yeah, re re responsive page yep. design. Yep. Um, what, what and and I I really um, like some of my friends in Phoenix. Some of the dentists I just love and adore. You look at their website and their picture. It looks like some cranky old man and you know you just don't see the chemistry but then my other friends who where it's a youtube video when 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 you see him talking on the video you think that's an adorable guy I like that guy let him be my dentist i do, are you a big more fan of uh, the dentist having a, a youtube video on his website versus just a mugshot no totally the vi video is really powerful um, but it's got to be done correctly a video can backfire if it's not the right video and you've got to adapt the video to the personality of uh, the practitioner speaking or the practice in general. So we've done, um, if you go to our uh, YouTube channel um, for IDM, which you can get to off the IDM website, you'll see we've done hundreds and hundreds of videos for different practices around the country. But they've all got a very different style because we're trying to achieve different things. You had a quick look at my daughter singing on my practice. Now that's not just because I wanted to have a fun video. It was very, very strategic. All the practices in my area, in where I live, very much targeting the early retiree. And there's lots of young families with lots of kids. So I wanted to get a fun message out. Nobody else was selling fun, so we've sold a fun message. If the kids look like it's going to be a fun place, if they think that it's going to be a relaxed environment, they're going to say to the parents, well, that would be the practice I'd like to choose. 
um, we've engaged uh, through the school with the same video. We got the school involved with the video. We got all the acting uh, schools locally. All the all the kids in that uh, video. They're all at the acting schools and the ballet schools, and so you know we've got no end of business from that. But we've also it was very strategic. It wasn't just a bit of a laugh. Um, so your videos got to have a, a purpose, like with all marketing. This is going to be kind of a long question, but um, <laughs> there's. These these young kids, how, how much student loan debt do you think the average Australian dentist walks out with? About 240000 240000 mm. That's Australian or U.S.? Uh, Australian. And and what is what would 240000 Australian dollars be in the U.S.? Uh, be around about $180,000. $180,000. Yeah. So they, they come out of school and they say, okay, um, I, I've been a dentist 30 years, and it seems like if I tell Carl, uh, you need to go to the dentist, it seems like half of America is afraid of you're going to hurt me, a shot, a drill, mm -hmm. ah, and the other half are afraid of cost. Mm -hmm. All I've really heard is I'm afraid of fear and cost. But she's hearing all this, all these people saying, no, you need chair-side milling. That's 180000 mm -hmm. So if she bought chair-side milling, she could double her student loan in debt by making one decision. Mm -hmm. And I notice you talk a lot on your marketing about um, the effective use of payment plans, mm -hmm. Um, so my question is convoluted. Do you think the Australian market is divided basically into just fear of the dentist and fear of costs and address fear and costs? Or do you think these equipment purchases have a great return on investment from your marketing savvy that people really want same day crowns? They really want a high tech laser office. They really, you know, would you, would you put your money in high tech? So I know that's a long question. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully there was something in there you could grab. <laughs> was yeah. anything in there worth it? Yeah, no, there's, there's, there's a few things that look, technology is fantastic. We live in, in a high tech world and people like technology, but it's not the technology that makes the difference. It's the doctor's passion about that technology. Ceric machines, what a great piece of kit, but I see a lot of them just collecting dust because they're being sold and not used. And I've seen practices that have built their entire practice around the Ceric, and, and wonderfully so. I think it needs to come from the philosophy of the doctor. Um, you know, whatever the doctor's passionate about, the, it, that passion will, will be taken on by the patient, um, as with all people that we trust. Um, but you, know, you, you mentioned that it's a fear of cost, fear of pain. It, it, there's another really big one out there, which is just people get apathetic. You know, lots of people just don't go to the uh, to the uh, dentist. Fifty percent of our society never go to the <coughs> dentist outside of an emergency. But these are fifty percent of people who are in business. You know, I've got lots of business friends who I ask them when did they, uh, you know, when did they last go to the practice? It could have been ten years ago, and they're in business. So they go, they got the money. And it's not the fear of pain. It's just they get busy and they don't they don't prioritise it. So I think you know um, I personally, I think our you know uh, ADA uh, do a very poor job of promoting the ADA, the Australian Dental Association, or the American Dental Association. No, or the, the Australian or the probably, Antarctica. They're probably the same. Or the Antarctica Dental Association. It probably wouldn't matter because they. <laughs> they talking about penguins, Americans, or Aussies? <laughs> <laughs> they don't do anything. We have this this uh, bullshit the Dental Awareness Week once a year, which doesn't even hit the TVs in any in any real form. But you know, there's a lot more to educate. Um, the Victorian Dental Board published a, uh, a pamphlet in 2013 citing 26 medical um, ailments that are linked to dentistry. Fantastic report. I email that to every single patient, a new patient. Will um, you email that to me? Yeah, of course I will. Um, gosh. I would love to get that. And, you know, that's what the... the, the, the NSW? That was the Victorian Dental Board. Victorian? But, yeah. In fact, it's even on my website, the uh, Divine Dental. You, it's actually, uh, I keep it on there for patients to read. I love the name, that Divine. One there. Le uh, oh, that one there. Oral and yeah. General Health. If you, link, if you click on that, it will take you to a, uh, a report. But this is the information the public need to know. Links between Oral Health and General Health, the case for action. Nice. So, equipment is good if it's your passion. If it's your passion um, and if you're going to use it in the right way, but equipment for equipment's sake, absolutely not. I, I always thought like uh, chair side milling and lasers and uh, CAD cam is, is kind of like a musical instrument. I mean, mm -hmm. just because you buy a guitar doesn't mean you're going to practice and That's get right. good at it. Some people buy a, a guitar and, and the next thing they know, they, they're, they have a rock band. Mm -hmm. And how many, how many kids got a musical instrument at Christmas and can't play mm. one song on it 30 years later. 
So so okay. you're right. If it's if it's your passion, then you can't afford not to have it. But if it's not your passion and you're just buying it for mm. a business return on investment, that's not gonna that's not gonna do it. Mm. So what so what do you think is so if I said to you, what is effective marketing, and what do you, what do you think is not effective marketing? What, what do you think the biggest marketing mistakes that you're seeing dentists doing? Um, not understanding it, first of all. So not not taking the time. So you know, as a dentist, you are in the top one percent of the intelligent people in the world. You know how to study, and yet for some reason you can't read a marketing book and understand that. So if, to think that it's some sort of mumbo jumbo. And you know SEO and PPC are, are outside the realms of understanding of a dentist is just nonsense. If you could learn how to be a dentist, well, this stuff's simple. So to spend some time, so you're not hoodwinked by all the people who bang on your door. So there's plenty of companies out there who just want to sell you their product, and it's very easy, especially when products can often be very low cost. Went to a practice in in Melbourne uh, about you know, three or four months ago. Walked in and he just said, you know, all my patients uh, are only interested in price. I said, is that true? He said, yeah, price is the only thing they're interested in. All my new patients are only interested in price. I said, that's very interesting because that's not my experience and you're in quite a nice area. I said, what marketing are you doing? Oh, he was doing Groupon, you know what Groupon is, and he was doing Shopper Docket. So the two shopper what? shopper docket. So when you get a docket shopper from, doc. from your uh, yeah your supermarket, you turn it over and there's a special offer. I mean, these are the the most you know, lowly marketing methods out there. And of course, if you're turning over your docket because you want fifty cents off your cup of coffee or you want a, a scale and clean cheaper, you're probably going to be price focused. Nothing wrong with the patient, but you're you're advertising in a price focused environment, so you're going to get a price focused patient. So, you know, so it, taking some time to understand what the different mediums do and to avoid all the nonsense out there. You know, the m- number of patients, cl- patients, clients, you know, have, have engaged in cinema advertising. Well, wh- what a load of nonsense that is. If you go to the cinema, you know, you're going to be taken on a two-hour journey, some magical journey. The last thing you're going to do is remember the, the advert at the beginning of the, the movie for a dentist. You might be motivated to go and buy some popcorn or, or Coca-Cola. You know, by advertising, but that's about it. So understanding, taking some time to understand that, then you can, when somebody, you know, puts a proposal in front of you that makes sense, you can actually understand it yourself and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. Then to track it to make sure you're getting statistics, so nothing's anecdotal. You know, if you say you've got 100 people come to your website and you've got, you know, five patients from that, what what is it? Where on the website have they been? Have they watched the video? Did they fill out a form? Did they enter into live chat? Live chat's just phenomenal. Live chat costs nothing to put live chat on your... On your and is that done by a robot or your staff? Staff. Oh, if it's done by a robot, then don't, don't do it. But it just, it dings. So what's the difference between the phone? You you'd never not answer the phone. It dings on your staff computer. Yeah, so it makes a little ding. So no different to the phone ringing, and yet you can type. And often, you know, my staff are good; they can multitask as well. And it's not going off all day. You know, last month uh, we got fourteen new patients via live chat. Now that, considering how the fact that live chat costs almost nothing to run, wonderful. And that helps augment the expensive Google Apps, or helps augment the. Who's the, who's uh, technology you use for the live chat? We use a company called Live Chat. Is that a dental play, or is no, it just just a, just a? Uh, and we provide it ourselves. We have a, a sub license. And but you know, but the um, again, I, I like data. I mean, like um, Dental Town has had a monthly poll mm-hmm. since 1998. And so when I say, you know, like four out of five dentists think this or three out of four dentists like that, I'm looking at data. I'm looking at a poll on Dental Town. Mm. And a lot of times people will say, yeah, but that was only only 380 people voted on that. Well, damn, you, this is the home of um, Robert uh, Mur- uh, Murdoch. What's his name? Rupert, Rupert Murdoch. I mean, when Fox News is having a poll of a, who's going to be the next president, a lot of times they've only surveyed a thousand people. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, that's a thousand Americans out of a third of a billion. But that's right. And I'm I'm polling three hundred and fifty dentists out of just two hundred eleven thousand. Yeah. So my polling is far bigger than Rupert Murdoch's, and he's trying to call the next, you know, the president of the United States or whatever. And um, um, so when I look at the data, um, people who have data, they're they're saying that 
50% of the phone calls going into a dental office while they're open go to voicemail. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, my God. So, I mean, couldn't a dentist double his revenue just by hiring another human to answer the other half of the calls that are going if, to voicemail? If that statistic was true, absolutely. I, I, would, absolutely. I, would, I would doubt that's the case in Australia. I think we're, we're uh, better manned in our dental practices than that. I don't, I don't have clients who don't answer their phone because they've made it a priority. Now, if they answer the phone well or not, that's a different thing. Uh, some are still going, dental surgery? Yeah, we have to work. <laughs> we have to work with those a little bit. Um, you know, so that that's a journey. Um, but no, I think most phone calls have been answered. But my argument is that a live chat should be answered in the same way. There's a lot of people who who it will be, were becoming phone phobic. We don't like receiving phone calls as much as we used to do. And there's a lot of people who just literally can't make a phone call between nine and five, stuck in an office or in a computer. Live chat's the new phone. And it's free, so why wouldn't you embrace it? So when you're consulting um, Mike Tamoni with SmilesInc.com, mm-hmm. two questions for him. I mean, in America, the at least 80% of the offices are open Monday through Thursday, 8 to 5, and they roll their phones over to answers at lunch. When the Federal Reserve, which hires more economists than any company in the world, I think they have like almost 4,000 PhD economists, and they do all kinds of research. And when they get to healthcare, they talk about availability. That one third of Americans, something like a something like 119 million workers, can't call their doctor between Monday and Friday eight to five because they're working. Yep. And then they get on their lunch break twelve to one, and they call, and that's when the dentists roll their phones over. Um, so, do hours matter? Of course they do. Of course they do. You know, we live in a fast-paced world. No matter where you live, um, people have got busy lives, and you know I, I live in a, a relatively small town. But we opened, you know, we opened on Saturday. Wow! And uh, Saturdays were booked out. The previous owner of the practice said, "Oh, Saturdays won't work. Everybody goes to the beach." No, a lot of people are fly in, fly out. Is where I live. They they can't go. Um, so what? Do you, so what hours would you recommend? It very much depends where you are. So if I was in the city, I was in Sydney, like we are now, it would be I'd be open seven days a week. Uh, I'd be open very long hours before and after work. You've got to be there when people want you. And the the argument is, and I hear this all the time, is that uh, oh we've got a, a gap at eleven o'clock, so why would we open at seven o'clock in the morning? Well, the reason you open at seven o'clock in the morning is that person was never going to come at eleven. So it doesn't matter if you got a gap at eleven. It's you know that's a different different patient. You're opening at seven. You're going to get that patient who needs to see you before work or after work. So it depends on depends on where you are. I mean, for instance, where I live, you know, Sundays would be irrelevant because you know Saturdays is enough capacity, and, and people do live uh, where I live for lifestyle reasons. In the city, I'm seven days a week now. And what about demographics? Would you would you tell uh, Mike on his new venture? Uh, demographics don't matter, or would you say demographics do matter? Go rural where there's less demand. What what would you what do, what is your thoughts on demographics? Well, Mike's got big plans, so he um, wants to be everywhere. So that's you know the demographics graphics matter, but he actually wants to be you know, nationwide and in every regional and city environment because he wants to build a national brand. Um, if you're buying a practice as a sole practitioner then dem- demographics matter ever so much. You know, there's certain pockets within Australia um, that are just massively over-serviced, and there's some that are reasonably. There isn't many pockets that are under-serviced anymore, um, but you know, there's certain areas that you, know, you, you just wouldn't, you just wouldn't uh, dream of opening yet another practice. Uh, normally within around about two two uh, hundred meters of a dental school, <laughs> they seem to want to uh, leave leave dental school and open quite close to where they uh, they learn sure. for some bizarre reason. Because you because you went to school there four years, you might have met your spouse mm-hmm. in that same town of four years. You learned that you know in in, yeah. in America, like like in Kansas City. I mean, they got the Royals, they have the Kansas City Chiefs football, they have the Plaza, they have like you live in Kansas City. For four years, who the hell wouldn't want to live in Kansas City? Mm-hmm. But the money is made when you get about two hours out of town. Do you think um, there's more money to be made in rural Australia than in downtown C- Sydney? C- or certainly, the, the, there was, but that's uh, and there may be just odd little pockets left. But a lot of that has been that those gaps have been uh, filled now, and also they're quite dangerous environments in terms of. 
the tipping point between underserviced and overserviced is quite finite. So you know, you take a, a city like uh, Sydney, it can always accept another dental practice. It can always accept another coffee shop. You take a you know a rural town that might have twenty you know twenty thousand people, and it had six practices, and suddenly it's now got twelve. And this has happened. It, it, you can't you continue to put practices into those very defined uh, populations. So that so you're saying that it got so competitive in Australia that the rural actually got saturated. Yeah, because the, you know, we're it, not there in America yet. Because the well, you know, uh, a lot of it is rumor, you know, and, and the rumor goes round and people go, "Oh, rural is where to be." So then there's there's a gold rush. Uh, we've seen it in towns like Mackay, which literally went from six practices to 12 practices in 2 years because there was this, oh well we need to go rural. Also the uh, the government uh, was paying quite nice subsidies to open practices in rural areas. Um, but like a lot of government subsidies, it's very easy for them to end up uh, having a negative effect, not a, not a positive effect. So wow, that was a, uh, I cannot believe uh, we've uh, um, what's one hot six minutes? Oh, one hour, one hour. Yeah, we, we <laughs> went over, uh, <laughs> sorry, we, we uh, went over our uh, six minutes. Um, the time flew so fast. Um, is there any other questions we didn't cover that I wasn't smart enough to ask? Or? <laughs> we didn't touch on the topic of um, payment plans. Oh, and, yeah. And I well, that was part of my long question. Yeah, that's what it's, yeah. Um, Half for fear of pain, half for fear of cost. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is something I am really passionate about at the moment, is that the presentation of um, a, 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 a treatment plan is often presented um, in a way that people are just left with the big number. Most dental practices these days will have a dental payment scheme of some sort. Most of the time it's tucked away in a drawer and it only gets pulled out when the patient is motivated to say, is there any other way I can pay for this? And often that's too late. So in, in my practice, we present every treatment as a weekly figure. So if you're in my practice... As a weekly figure? As a weekly figure. And uh, we, How much it costs per week? Yeah. In a, in a payment plan. So if you're coming in to see me and I was presenting to you the, the treatment, I might say uh, the doctor today has prescribed a crown and a two surface filling. That would be $2,200. And the way we do that here, that's just $49 a week. Will that be okay for you, Howard? So that language means people are starting to know that they can pay it off over time. It's also meaning that it's about my financial arrangements with you, as if you're buying a car. The car on the lot's 50000 but it's $199 a week. And it's not making the patient feel, A, have bill shock, but also feel bad about their own financial situation. Too many times um, people say, well, you know, the, uh, the treatment the doctor's prescribed is a, a crown and a two surface filling, that'd be $2,200. Um, and they shut up, and then you have this massive resistance to, oh, I'll have to think about it, I'll have to talk to my uh, spouse, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And then if somebody says, well, we can, you, we can organize a, a payment program for you, you're already feeling bad about you, the fact that you haven't you know, paid for it cash or, or you've had to even think about it, and you're on the back foot, and the chances are that person's going to leave, and as soon as they leave, their motivation for dentistry leaves with them unless they're in pain. So um, the correct use of payment plans I see has been you know, a real big area that uh, the profession needs to, to look at. I think it done correctly, it gets people into more treatment that they need. If they need the treatment, it's good for the, for the patient, it's good for the practice, um, it's good for everybody. So are you carrying the paper? In, well, we, we use two methods. So one, yes, uh, where it's just a direct debit and I'm carrying the paper. Um, and then we also have a credit facility where we get paid up front, but we pay the interest on behalf of the patient. And who's that through? So uh, the, the one where we're, it's interest-free, but we pay the interest is through a company called Surgigy Easy Pay. It's called what? Surgigy. Don't ask me to spell it. C -E -R. Surgery, is that an Australian play or is yes, that it? No. Is, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then the direct debit service I use is um, uh, one called Dental Members Australia. But it's just literally a direct debit service, which is uh, very simple to use, an incredibly good platform, uh, lovely people behind it, and um, we use it in various ways. By the way, on marketing, so many of these um, Australians have .com, .au. Do you think they should also buy just the .com without the uh, .au? No. No, we only relate to the .com, .au. We see .com as being either American or global. 
Um, American or global? Yeah, but the the dot com dot au is the uh, the default here. So dental members have your teeth fixed with easy weekly payment and capped free dentistry, up to ten thousand dollar dental procedures with easy weekly payments. So dentalmembers.com.au, that's the direct debit? Yeah, that's a direct debit service. They have other services as well. The the gentleman behind that, Dr. Safa Suzani, you need to get him on your podcast. The man is a genius. He's, uh, I think, probably um, you know one of the, the brightest thinkers in dentistry today. And then what was the other one? Surgigy. Surgigy, easy pay. Uh, so, so what is easy pay? So that's a... Um, a credit service, they offer 6, uh, 12, 18 and 24 months interest free to the patient, but we pay the interest. So you, you pay it up front? Let's say I had, um, just easy math, a thousand dollars of dentistry done. Yeah. So then they would deduct, if you, if, if you wanted to pay it off over 6 or 12 months, they would deduct, deduct I think 3.9% and then send me the balance. If you paid it off over 24 months, they deduct 7.9% and send me the balance. Either way, I get paid up front. And so which do you prefer, uh, that, uh, getting um, where you have a discounted rate to get all your money today, um, or? I, I use a, a, a mixture of both. One of the reasons I like the direct debit is we're, we're setting the terms. It's my money, we're setting the terms. I've given my staff a uh, you know, set of parameters um, to work with, and uh, they, they know what to work with. As far as I'm concerned, from my point of view, uh, I don't care if the dollar's in my bank account or on a balance sheet, it's still a dollar. So if I'm going to get that money over time, um, and I'm also building a future income, so you know, when I walk into my practice on, a, on the first of the month, I know I've got a certain amount of income coming in and it builds over time. Um, some people starting out in practice, uh, maybe not as well established, uh, they may be more concerned about cash flow, so then they should be using the, the credit facilities. But the direct debit service is, is great because you no credit check. You make a value judgment on the on the patient. You can be flexible, um, and it's human. So the way uh, it works, we 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 haven't had one bad debt, not a single bad debt, but we've had we've had uh, payments fail. So the girls get on the phone and they say, "Oh yes, I had to take the cat to the uh, the vet and I had a it. Don't worry, just catch up next week. It's it's part of the service, and um, we, we we deal with humans all day long. So it's nice to have a human solution. And we're providing dentistry to people who need it, who may not have had that dentistry otherwise. Do you think we uh, made a mistake in treating humans and we should have been treating the cat? <laughs> I swear to God, you know how many things, if I had a dollar for every time in 30 years, I'm across the street from a vet. <laughs> His office is twice the size of mine and he does twice the money that I do. Uh -huh. And I've known him forever. And I mean, I cannot believe how many people say, well, I can't afford that. I just spent $5,000 on my cat. I'm like, $5,000 on your yeah. cat? Wow. But I, I got to tell you a couple of um, just finance stories. I will we'll leave on that. I know uh, I'm over, on overtime with you. But, you know, there was um, like 85 different amazing sewing machines until the Irish diaspora. And then after that, you only hear a singer. Mm -hmm. Because when um, one million Irish died during the Irish, the Irish famine... And another one million landed on the shores of America 40 years before the Statue of Liberty. And the only jobs were textiles. And you could only get a textile job if you owned a sewing machine. And Singer saw that, and they didn't have 50 bucks. They came with a share on their back. Singer was the first guy who said, I'll tell you what, they, they don't have 50 bucks. So he went out there with installment credit and said, look, Irish boy, I'll give you a sewing machine, and you'll get a $3 a week job. But every Friday, you bring old man Singer a dollar. He eliminated every other sewing machine mm -hmm. company in, in America. And you ask any grandma in America today, what's the greatest sewing machine ever? They'll all say Singer. And it was because of um, installment credit. Mm -hmm. And then all the Americans will say um, that um, Henry Ford invented the, um, the assembly line. I said, okay, well, keep going to the story because why did that assembly line close down? Why did it end after 10 million cars? Why did it go bankrupt and uh, shut down? And it's because General Motors um, launched GMAC financing with old man Ford. You had to give him your $668, and if you're a dollar short, you didn't get a car. Mm. And General Motors came out with GMAC financing and said, our Chevy is not $668. We have installment credit over three years. And what's amazing is GMAC financing has delivered $3 of profit. 
for every one dollar GM has made in selling cars. Mm -hmm. So if you make the damn car, you make a buck. <laughs> if you finance the car, you make three bucks. Mm -hmm. And then you look at America. Um, what is America actually number one in? Well, it's um, military, it's movies, it's music, but it's mostly insurance, banking, and financing. Mm. And a little known stat that people don't realize that Manhattan, just Manhattan, has a larger GDP than all of Russia. And they don't make cars in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. It's the New York Stock Exchange, it's Goldman Sachs, it's insurance, banking, and financing. And there's actually... Ask any MBA. There's more money in finance. Like, like, like. You look at all those boats in the harbor. Mm. Would you rather own the business that's making all those boats, or would you rather own the business that's financing all those boats? Mm. And I guarantee you, the guy that's financing all those yachts makes more money than the guy making all yeah, those yachts. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah. So I think. Um, what I tell these kids is when they come out of school, I said, you know, if I, I want you to be hungry, humble, hustle. If I could pick one trait for you to have, it'd be a chair side manner that conveys trust, likability, communication with your patient and your staff. Um, secondly, um, they're, um, they're afraid. They're afraid you're going to hurt them. So talk about nitrous oxide, all, you know, being gentle, raise your hand, we'll stop. And then address cost mm. and in America the stats are very clear for the 30 years I've been watching them that in America if it costs more than one thousand dollars ninety percent of the time it's financed mm -hmm. on a credit card monthly payments only ten percent of houses and cars in America are paid for in cash and those are usually the the retirees mm. their kids are gone their house is paid off and that's the only people Americans give discounts yeah. to Oh, we'll give you a, we'll give you a senior citizen discount because your kids are gone, you're retired, you no longer have a house payment, a car payment, whatever. Uh, so we'll give you a ten percent discount. <laughs> mm. And here we're just you know vast majority of dentistry is still just expecting the patients to have the money, and uh, that's not how most people live. Most people live pay packet to pay packet, and you pay packet. Yeah, pay packet, wage bill, wage income, whatever you pay call packet. it. Pay packet. I've never heard pay it called packet. a pay packet either. Yeah. Yeah. So that's your paycheck. Yeah, paycheck, paycheck it, to it, paycheck. But you call it pay packet. Yeah. A packet of pay. Yeah. Huh. And what'd you call the mailbox? <laughs> letterbox. The, the letterbox. I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, Carl. Um, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. Uh, thank you so much it's for all that you do. Great to see you again. And, and, and thank you very you. much for having me on the show. And good luck with that uh, 10 year old daughter. Yeah. Thank you. I hope she uh, turned out to be the uh, love of your life. She already is. Because uh, I had four perfect boys before. Any of them were 16, I was going to write a book on how to raise perfect children. And then one by one, they got their car keys and got in more trouble. <laughs> so so your 10-year-old little girl, as soon as she yeah. has her own car and her own car keys. We're in a very sweet zone. Well. <laughs> yeah, we have you, a lot of fun. <laughs> you're in the sweet zone. Exactly. You're in the sweet zone. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck on everything you do. Yeah. Thank you very much.